the end of an era for a legendary toy retailer. The famous FAO Schwartz on Fifth Avenue closed its doors tonight. The reason? Rising rents. In 2015, FAO Schwartz announced the permanent closure of their flagship location in Manhattan. The news was met with widespread heartbreak, with one reporter even equating it to the death of childhood itself. The store's fanciful design and impressive products enthralled both children and adults alike for the past 30 years, often seeing generations of families make annual pilgrimages to the self-proclaimed toy mecca. My mom used to bring me, I used to bring my son, so before it closed, I wanted to bring my three and four-year-old. While the chain had demonstrated its resilience before, many longtime fans of the retailer feared that this would serve as the end of FAO's story. A story which actually began over a century and a half earlier, with the man who would build an empire. Frederick August Otto Schwartz was born on October 18, 1836, in Hereford, Westphalia, Germany. Frederick was the youngest of four sons, Henry the eldest, followed by Richard, and finally Gustav. At 14, he secured an apprenticeship with one of the top merchants of the region, cultivating a natural talent for business. Today, you become a man of business. I'm looking forward to it, Headmaster. Mm, you will love business. By this point, all three of his older brothers had emigrated to America, and in 1856, the then 20-year-old Frederick decided to embark on his own journey across the Atlantic to join them. It is the American way! He settled in Baltimore and was soon employed as a sales clerk alongside his brothers, at the stationery and fancy goods store Schwartzman & Co. Always the eager salesman, Frederick wasted no time in looking for new ways to expand the business. As it happened, sometimes the European exporters would package toys and other goods with their stationery in the hopes of increasing their market. Frederick decided to embrace this opportunity and began to display the toys in the shop windows. The unique, handcrafted toys proved to be quite novel with the American public, and soon they became the top-selling items in the store. Thanks to his business instincts, Frederick quickly rose through the store's ranks, eventually being named as a co-partner alongside his brother Henry. In 1862, Frederick, Henry, and Gustav left Schwartzman & Co. to establish their own toy and goods store, Schwartz Brothers Importers, becoming what many cite as the first incarnation of the FAO Schwartz brand. The biggest step came when Frederick heard that history was happening in Manhattan and relocated his family to the greatest city in the world in 1870, opening the Schwartz Toy Bazaar on Broadway. Over the course of the next several years, Schwartz built quite a reputation for himself, rising up to be one of the most prominent toy retailers in New York. The contacts he had maintained from his sales clerk days ensured first access to the most coveted imports from Europe, which proved to be a blessing as his competition grew. By 1875, Macy's emerged as Schwartz's top competitor, opening a large toy section in their own department store just a few blocks away. As the holiday season approached, Schwartz knew he would have to do something dramatic to stay ahead. So, he decided to go right to the top and invited the big man himself to appear at his store, becoming the first retailer to feature a live Santa Claus. Now, you'll find that a great many children will be undecided as to what they want for Christmas. When that happens, you immediately suggest one of these items. You understand? I certainly do. <laughs> Good. Starting on Thanksgiving Day, excited children could finally have a chance to tell Mr. Claus their Christmas wishes who would then do his best to point exacerbated parents in the direction of Schwartz's wide selection of products. The promotion caught on like wildfire, with hour-long queues often surrounding Schwartz's store, and soon his competitors realized just how much money could be made off of jolly old Saint Nick. Fa la 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 ka -ching. The true irony is that, thanks to Miracle on 34th Street, Macy's has since gotten all the credit for pioneering department store Santas, when in reality, they, much like Gimbel's in the film, were forced to adopt the model to compete with Schwartz's success. 
Schwartz's long tradition of elaborate window displays also became a Christmas time staple, helping the store grow from just a retailer to a tourist destination. Though Macy's did beat Schwartz in this regard, as their first major Christmas display premiered just a year before his did, showcasing tableaus of the timeless Christmas classic, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Building off the enormous success of the previous season, in 1876, Schwartz began to expand his market, first by opening a second location in New York, and then statewide when he premiered the Schwartz Toy Bazaar catalog. The annual catalog would be sent to eager children across the state, who could then mail in their orders, and their parents' money, directly to the store. Its contents ranged from porcelain dolls and model trains, to full-size playhouses and automobiles with working lights and horns. One aspect of the collection that still remains true today, though, was the high price tag. While these were the most exclusive toys on the market, for a nation recovering from a civil war which had just ended a decade prior, the price was often a sticking point for many poorer families. On the low end, Schwartz's toys started at $1.50, going all the way up to $50. Though there was good news for New York City residents as they received free shipping on any order over $5. By Grabthar's hammer. What a savings. As Schwartz's toy empire continued to grow, he decided to consolidate his efforts into one central location and relocated throughout Manhattan several times before eventually settling on West 23rd Street. At this point, Schwartz the Man had practically become synonymous with his brand, and capitalizing off of his fame, the new store premiered with a brand new name, F.A.O. Schwartz. Over the next 20 years, patrons from around the world would travel to visit the eponymous store, which occupied seven stories and boasted a basement that stretched for an entire city block. Some of the more famous clients included Brooklyn Bridge designer Washington Augustus Roebling, silent film star Jackie Coogan, and President Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt actually held a special connection to the Schwartz family, as Henry was one of the first retailers in America to sell the famous Stife teddy bear, which had grown in popularity thanks to a political cartoon depicting the president's refusal to kill a captured black bear while on a hunt. Future King Prachatipak of Thailand once bought a rocking horse from FAO himself while visiting the store with the royal family truly making Schwartz one of the first toy makers to a king. It's a difficult responsibility When you accept an appointment from His Majesty You must strive for just the perfect quality When you're the first toy maker to the king Schwartz would oversee one final move in his lifetime, as his beloved toy store moved on to Fifth Avenue where it would continue to exist in one form or another for the next 107 years. By the time of his death in 1911, it was stated that his store sold over 16,000 individual items. In the wake of his death, Schwartz's children continued to successfully run his business, moving the store to 745 Fifth Avenue in 1931, where it would remain for the next 55 years. The catalog had steadily grown to encompass the entire United States, and now children across the nation could call a special phone number to speak with Santa and Mrs. Claus every holiday season. Even with the chain's continued growth, interest from within the Schwartz family began to wane, as its members found successful careers outside the toy world. F.A.O.'s son Herbert had become an etymologist, and even had a genera of bees named after him. And his great-grandson, Frederick August Otto Schwartz, Jr., is a well-known lawyer who once served as chief counsel to the United States Senate Committee on Intelligence, more famously known as the Church Committee in the 70s. In 1963, it was collectively decided to sell the company to Parent Magazine, and for the first time in 101 years, F.A.O. Schwartz was no longer a family-run business. Like a Hogwarts defense against the dark arts teacher, the 60s and 70s initiated Schwartz's curse with frequent changes in ownership, with Parents Magazine selling to W.R. Grace & Co. after seven years of operation. Considering the high turnover rate, the retailer continued to perform moderately well. 
Schwartz's annual income was estimated to be around $20 million, and there was still an effort to maintain the business practices introduced by FAO himself. The holidays continued to yield the highest revenue, with Schwartz's famous window displays now boasting several notable window dressers, including Where the Wild Things Are author Maurice Sendak and gay and BDSM photographer Robert Maplethorpe. You know, for kids. This momentum would ultimately falter once Grace & Co. gave up its ownership to the Swiss toy retailer Franz Carl Weber International after just four years. Weber's commitment to cheaper, mass-produced merchandise led the chain to lose its unique edge over its competitors, especially when customers could find the same toys at Macy's or the up-and-coming Toys R Us for a third of the Schwartz price. When you think of toys, think of toys R Us. Additionally, since Weber's headquarters were based in Zurich, they could only remain peripherally aware of the operations of their American-based stores, often overlooking easily solved problems that were hurting their revenue. To combat their falling profits, Weber decided to focus on expansion instead, opening up 31 new stores including new flagship locations in San Francisco, Chicago, and Boston. Unsurprisingly, this rapid expansion proved to be too costly for the struggling chain, and 10 locations were closed over the next five years. Weber decided to abandon ship in 1985, and sold the company to American real estate and investment firm Christina Companies Incorporated. While Christina would only own the retailer for a few months, it would eventually be bought out from them by their own CEO, and the man who in turn would save Schwartz from extinction, Peter L. Harris. Harris was joined in co-ownership of Schwartz by the Philadelphia-based investment banker Peter C. Morse. Together, the Peters became a modern-day version of Walt and Roy Disney, with Harris as the showman and Morse overseeing the financials. Harris also emphasized the importance of not just the product, but the experience of buying it as well, coining the term entertainment retail. It was determined that a brand new location in New York would serve as the center of the relaunch. Conveniently moving just across the street from Schwartz's current home on Fifth Avenue, the new store occupied over 40,000 square feet spanning two floors, in what once was a General Motors showroom. As guests approached the store's new grand entrance, they were greeted by living toy soldiers flanking each doorway. We welcome our friends to FAO. Lots of great toys right inside. We're so glad you're here and it will show. So come right on in, your moment's arrived. Yes, indeed, welcome to FAO Schwartz. Very good. Once inside, the massive showroom took Harris's concept of entertainment retail to the next level, as each elaborate display was filled with countless toys, ranging from Schwartz's signature life-size stuffed animals to a mini Ferrari capable of driving up to 30 miles per hour. Children were encouraged to interact with special experiences tailored just for them, including a hair salon, grocery store, and nursery, where they could adopt a new friend from helpful nurses who would also provide a birth certificate with the date and doll's name. It's summertime <laughs> Other notable features included animatronic trees and animals, a wall-sized gaming console, and walk-around characters, including Raggedy Ann and Andy, and whatever the hell this is. At the center of it all was a 28-foot clock tower dubbed the Humpty Dumpty Clock. Every 15 minutes, it would come to life and the toys upon it would sing the store's theme song. Welcome to Our World of Toys, written by Bobby Gosh. Despite all of these wondrous displays, there was one major element that would soon rise above the rest. <laughs> While on a trip to New York, Hollywood screenwriter Anne Spielberg visited Schwartz with her family and soon became enraptured by an oversized piano that you walked on to play. She told her movie-making brother about it, who suggested she add it to the screenplay she was currently writing. It was even said that the fictional toy owner in the film, played by Robert Loja, That's Robert Loja. R as in Robert Loja. O as in Oh My God, It's Robert Loja. B was based on Peter Harris, with both having a characteristic childlike sense of wonder. 
Big was released in the summer of 1988, and due to its overwhelming success, became the greatest marketing tool Schwartz could have hoped for, especially since the brand famously refused to produce any commercials themselves. Thousands of customers began flocking to the store just to try their hand, or foot rather, at the infamous piano. Though the piano featured in the film was not the store's original, as a special three-octave version was made in order for Hanks and Loja to properly play Heart and Soul. This newer model was subsequently reproduced across all of FAO Schwartz's stores. Schwartz also hired performers to recreate Big's Heart and Soul scenes several times a day, as well as perform a few other classic pieces. Nothing excites kids today more than some Bach. I love the kid in the front who could not be any less interested. Thanks to Harris's leadership, the New York store's revenue jumped from 7.8 million to 54 million in just two years, and an additional 14 stores opened by 1990. Morse left the company that year, and Harris decided to sell the company for a fifth time to Dutch retailer. Yeah, not even gonna try that. KBB. He would remain CEO until 1992, when he would finally step down, having successfully taken the company from ruin to prosperity in less than a decade. Hartmark CEO John Eiler was named as his replacement, and while Eiler continued the company's rapid expansion, he also sought to incorporate more name-brand toys into the store's lineup. The first Barbie boutique opened in 92. And while the retailer had sold the doll since her introduction in 1959, this was the first time she had a separate mini-store dedicated entirely to her brand. Barbies modeling the latest fashion could be seen on a motorized catwalk, and a limited edition FAO Barbie was created to be sold exclusively within the chain. This led to the creation of an entire FAO Schwartz line of toys and clothing in 1997, reflecting the brand's new logo. Schwartz also held large premieres for the hottest new toys with Nintendo being one of the more frequent as Schwartz was the first American retailer to sell the NES in 1985. Other major releases included Tickle Me Elmo, Tamagotchis, and the dreaded Furby. As the decade wore on, the competition grew fiercer as major brands like Disney and Warner Brothers started to adopt the entertainment retail model. New specialty toy stores such as Build-A-Bear, The Lego Store, and the American Girl Store all grew in prominence, offering similar experiences to Schwartz, such as constructing your own stuffed animal or a cafe where children could dine with their dolls, as seen here with an unimpressed Conan O'Brien. She uh, was born in Germany. Her parents are German. Mm -hmm. She lives in current times. Mm -hmm. She entered the United States illegally, <laughs> and her activities are suspicious. Looking to remain the top seller, Schwartz premiered five new mega flagship stores across the nation that would try and emulate the grandeur of the New York original, but with more. The San Francisco location featured a series of animated fairy tale vignettes, including a life-size giant's foot from Jack and the Beanstalk. While Las Vegas played off of its home in the forum shops at Caesars Palace by erecting a 48-foot tall animated Trojan horse. The horse would move its head, blow steam out of its nostrils, and compartments within it would open every 15 minutes to perform the Schwartz theme song, as seen in this delightfully retro commercial. The Vegas location also featured a full-size Star Wars cantina complete with a working bar and animatronics of Figrin Dan and the modal nodes, created by famed theme park animatronic designer Garner Holt. To further distance themselves from their competitors, Schwartz tried to enter the candy business with their newest division, FAO Sweets. Of the uh, Sugar Rush Von Schweetzes. I'm sure you've heard of us, so it'd be embarrassing for you if you haven't. <laughs> While Schweetz was primarily utilized in the flagship locations, by the late 90s it had established several independent stores as well, even introducing an ice cream parlor in the early 2000s. Even with the elaborate store designs, as the new millennium approached, sales continued to decline. By this point, the chain held 39 locations, mostly in major cities, but relatively few in the growing suburban communities that instead relied on toy discount chains like Toys R Us and Target. Swartz had begun to cater to wealthy toy collectors, with a $25,000 Swarovski-encrusted Ferrari and a $30,000 motion simulator. 
seen here with a still unimpressed Conan O'Brien. Movie tie-in promotions were also mined for additional sales, including a Titanic collection that featured a $395 doll of Rose and a $2,500 crystal model of the titular ship. Still, even New York's elite seemed uninterested in their products, and FAO soon found themselves alienating the very clientele they relied on the most. Children. To make matters worse, in 2000, Schwartz lost John Eiler to Toys R Us, where he would lead them to open their own flagship location in Times Square the following year. Fearing his departure, Schwartz had paid Eiler an estimated $2.4 million to ensure his loyalty, which Eiler happily took, and still resigned just nine days later, leading Schwartz to sue both him and Toys R Us. While they would ultimately settle out of court, between the negative publicity surrounding the legal battle and the drop in tourism in the wake of 9-11, KBB would ultimately sell the chain to toy retailer Right Start at the end of 2001 effectively bringing Schwartz's golden era to an end. By 2003, Wright Start's prospects had yet to improve and they were ultimately forced to file for bankruptcy, first in April, and again in December, three weeks before Christmas. The Fifth Avenue location closed in January of 2004, and many of its elaborate displays, including the iconic Humpty Dumpty clock, were dismantled, and either auctioned off to private buyers or destroyed. All other flagship locations, including the ones in Vegas, San Francisco, and Chicago, were closed, and the company was teetering on the brink of complete liquidation. That is, until, in a surprising turn of events, the chain was bought out once more, this time by a private equity firm run by Dave Shaw. Estimated to have paid $45 million for the San Francisco and Vegas stores, and placing himself $10 million in debt, Shaw hired famed architect David Rockwell to handle the remodel. Nine months after its closure, the New York store once again reopened, showcasing a more modern and, quote, clean aesthetic. The defining feature was a computer-controlled ceiling made up of 20,000 individual lights. And while the Humpty Dumpty clock did not return, a small tribute to its face was hung up in its honor. The movie tie-ins were brought back, culminating with a Harry Potter line of toys, featuring life-size stuffed animals of various mythical creatures that populated the books and films, including Hedwig, a 155-pound Hungarian horntail, and literally the stuff of my nightmares, Aragog the Giant Spider. In 2008, Schwartz decided it was time to light the lights with the creation of their Muppet Whatnot Workshop, where customers could design and build their very own Muppet. Yeah, Whatnots, they're, they're kind of the extras of the Muppet universe. Yeah, they're, they're, they're who we call when we need somebody, you know, on short notice. Okay. And it soon became the greatest thing in the history of the store. In spite of all these additions, Shaw could only keep the chain afloat until 2009 when he sold it for next to nothing to one of the very brands that had caused Schwartz's initial demise. You could not live with your own failure. Where did that bring you? Back to me. With Toys R Us finally in charge, they quickly snapped half of Schwartz's stores out of existence. The Las Vegas location permanently closed in 2010, turning into the country's largest H&M. Efforts shifted to smaller pop-up kiosks located in malls, airports, and their own Toys R Us locations, with New York remaining the only permanent installation. Even with Toys R Us's drastic cost-cutting measures, they continued to fight a losing battle against their newest competition, Amazon. Just as the discount toy retailers led to Schwartz's failure a decade prior, the growing convenience of online shopping proved to be too much for the struggling chain. Evolving into more of a playground than a store, Customers would still come to experience its offerings, but leave without purchasing anything. The costly New York rent would prove to be the final nail in the coffin, as Toys R Us determined it was just too damn high, and let FAO's lease expire in 2015. And on July 15th, just one year shy of its 30th anniversary in that location, the iconic Fifth Avenue toy store closed forever. In spite of the Toys R Us promise to revive Schwartz in the near future, they soon had their own issues to contend with. 
Nevertheless, if there was one thing Schwartz had become known for besides its extravagant toys, was its perseverance. And as fate would have it, this would not be the end for the beloved toy store. Toys R Us sold Schwartz for a ninth time to the Southern California-based investment firm 360 Group. And in 2018, 156 years after its initial founding, FAO Schwartz reopened in New York City, this time in Rockefeller Plaza. The site of New York's famous Christmas tree lighting, the new location serves as both a prime tourist destination and plays homage to Schwartz's holiday roots. Opting for a smaller, more streamlined appearance, guests can still find updated versions of some of Schwartz's more memorable features. The live toy soldier is also returned, boasting new uniforms designed by fashion icon Gigi Hadid. And what I'm really excited about is uh, they are going to have female soldiers for the first time. So, oh, man. Yeah. Despite its tumultuous history, nostalgia for the chain only continues to grow as many fans still fondly recount the incredible experiences they had exploring Schwartz's wonderful world of toys. As the founder of the New York Fashion Institute of Technology's toy design department notes, there is an intimate relationship that children have with their toys, and it's the same relationship that the store owner and public have to have, a singular and personal relationship so people can return to that enchanted place of childhood. And for a brand that has persisted through nine buyouts, three closures, and 160 years of operation, it seems that FAO Schwartz will continue to exist as one of these enchanted places for years to come. <laughs>